Hey folks, welcome to episode five of season one of Strenuous Conversations. I'm Ryan, the man who would be night. Today we're going to get our workout done and talk about chapter four of Josef Pipa's book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture. Um, as always, the workout is posted below. We're going to, I'm going to be working on the uh, 44 kilo kettlebell swings. I'm going to try and do at least one or two rounds with uh, one-handed swings, and we'll see how that goes. But I've got my uh, trusty 70 here in case it gets too heavy for me. All right, let's get after it. All right, workout was complete. That was, uh, that was intense. Starting out with the, the one hand swings on the 44 was, uh, was a good call, I suppose, but stopping after the first two rounds and going to the 200 swings was a better call. Let's get into chapter four. So to recap chapter one, why are we talking about leisure? Because Western civilization was built on leisure. If you're gonna rebuild a civilization, a culture, not just an economy, you have to come to terms with what kind of a culture that's going to be and um, whether or not leisure is going to be a part of it. Chapter two, we talked about the intellectual worker, how that represents uh, a final triumph of the concept of total work. It takes what was originally a leisured pastime and turns it into a paid profession and places it at the service of a state. And it's marked by three characteristics. The only path to success, in this case truth, is hard work. It's the hardness of the work that measures the success. And two, or and three, the success is at the service of a planned social system. Chapter three, we got into the heart of what is leisure. So leisure opposes this concept of work at all three of these aspects. First, le leisure is not about actively going out and grabbing and making things happen. Leisure is essentially a receptive, open gaze, looking at things as they are and accepting them, at, accepting them as they are. It is not opposed to action, but it is a foundation for action and an antidote to a philosophy of exclusive action or a bias toward action. Secondly, 
as opposed to the hardness of the work being the measure of success, leisure posits the apprehension of things as they are and a, tr a fundamentally trusting attitude in the goodness of creation. That is what matters. That's the goal. And it finds its ultimate expression not in work, but in the festival. And finally, the third aspect where work at the work is at the service of the social state of the social system. Leisure is primarily about the individual. It's about the full flowering, the full potential of human nature. Um, so leisure is not for the sake of work. Work exists for the sake of leisure. So now we move into chapter four and obviously the next step is to determine um, how do we recapture this attitude of leisure and what would it look like if we did? So we're gonna talk about the, that first question in chapter four and we'll get into chap the second in chapter five. So he starts off with this interesting quote. Remember, leisure is not a Sunday afternoon idol or idol. That means it's a, not a, a restful vacation in the country, but the preserve of freedom of education and culture and of that undiminished humanity which views the world as a whole. And that sentence right there defi defines leisure and places it in the context of a full humanity that is able to put both work and rest into the context of something else. Namely, being at one, being at peace with creation, with things as they are and as they are meant to be. He says, we, we can't deny that the world of the worker is taking shape with what he calls dynamic force. And he even raised the, raises the possibility that there's a demonic force behind it, forcing it into existence. Anybody who lived through that period of time when Germany and all of Europe really was cut in two, and the speed with which former allies turned into Cold War enemies, that all happened in a very short period of time. Not many people foresaw it happening. Um, even Stalin didn't want it to happen. He wanted to extend his control all the way to uh, include Germany and France. There, there was some basis for people at the time to, be, to wonder, uh, is there some kind of demonic activity going on here? What, is it possible to resist this invasion of the world of the worker into every sphere of life? He put, he says, well, some approaches have already been tried at the level of academia, not in popular culture, the level of academia. It's important to understand where he's talking. Art for art's sake was one of those. Like, no, I'm not going to do my, I'm not going to do my painting or my poetry as a propaganda tool for the state that sullies the purity of my art. My art exists for its own sake. Another ploy that was tried was, well, we can't be at the service of the state that goes against tradition. Um, we are the inheritors of a heritage. And that's super easy to plow over because like, who cares about the past? We're living in the present. The, the modern world is upon us. The, the past is dead. Is it possible for any of those uh, objections based on a fundamental humanism, a humanist attitude? Is it possible for any of them to resist? Do they have that force? Well, in order to understand that, we have to understand what are the obstacles to a culture of leisure. He looks at this by, by talking about the de-proletarianization of the proletariat. And that's a lot of big words, so we're gonna break it down a little bit. If you go back to Karl Marx, he divided society into the proles, the proletariat, and the bourgeois. Proletariat, he roughly defined as the worker, like exclusively the preserve of the worker, as opposed to the bourgeois, which are the privileged landed class. And he defined history as the struggle between these two economic classes. All of history is economy in Marx's view. So the intellectual worker that we talked about previously is an attempt to erase this cultural distinction between the haves and the have-nots by making the haves, these intellectual class, making them 
ha or have-nots, putting them on the same sphere as the lowly worker. Pipa objects to this. He said, first of all, work is not a proper basis to bridge that gap. Turning the, the occupation of a philosopher into work doesn't make him any less a privileged class. That's the second objection is that regardless of what you call it, the fact of the gulf between the classes still exists. That is a proper target for obliteration. He says, absolutely, we need to be bridging this gap between a half of society that has the leisure to pursue the intellect, arts, the culture, these, these things that make life more enjoyable and more meaningful, and the other half of society who doesn't have time for leisure, they, all they, they do is they work, they come home, and they find that they have no energy to engage in a meaningful hobby. Um, they just have to get their rest in while they can, get some recreation in while they can, and only to prepare themselves to go back to work. And he agrees that this is not a, this is not a fair, not a just distinction of society. It condemns one half of society to never reaching its true potential. But calling the people who have have-nots does not make them any less haves. You don't erase this distinction by taking the people who have this heritage and dragging them down to the level of the people who have not. What you ought to be doing is taking the people who don't have it and bringing them up to the level of the people who do. This introduction of the intellectual worker does not, does not shrink the proletariat, it extends it to the rest of society. He also points out proletariat and poor are not, contrary to Marx, are not necessarily synonymous. That's within the context of a specific system, um, specifically the capitalist system that, get, that rose up after the uh, fall of, or after the onset of the Industrial Revolution. In the medieval world, a beggar is not a proletarian. But in the modern world, under a planned state, even the scientist, the economist, the people who the top of the social ladder, they are proletarians, even though they have everything that they can have under the system. The dark side of proletarianism is um, not the fact that it's confined to a society, it's the fact of what makes a proletarian. And that is present whether nobody in society has it or all of society have it. He, def he, he goes in to define proletarian as one who is fettered to the process of work. We'll break that down a little bit. Work meaning that which is useful towards a planned state, a planned end, and fettered meaning they don't have a choice but to live their lives working at the, at the service of the state or the social system. <sighs> Now these, these fetters, these chains that keep them bound to work come in three flavors. So all propertyless wage earners, meaning those who own nothing but their power to work, are fettered to work. If you do not have property, meaning land or a house or a shop, then you have no choice but to work in order to achieve your daily bread. Secondly, those who live in a totalitarian state and are coerced into working, work or go to jail, work or die. And these are the two external fetters. Thirdly, the inner impoverishment of the individual, meaning somebody whose intellectual and emotional capability and their worldview has been artificially shrunk beyond that which is their birthright so that they can't think of anything but work and resting from work. Two key distinctions. 
This first one, the first two represent external fetters. Work or starve, work or go to jail are conditions imposed upon the person from without. But the third, the impoverishment of the human, the impoverishment of the human being so that they can't do anything but work, that is an internal fetter. To return to the original question, how do we extend a leisure culture to all of society? Well, we have to get rid of these three obstacles, these three things that keep people chained to work. The individual needs to own property, has to have a mechanism whereby he can save proper, save his wages, earn property, and take control of the means of production of his own work. I think it's Chesterton's quip, it sounds like Chesterton anyways, the problem with capitalism is that there's not enough capitalists. Everyone needs to be a capitalist, which Chesterton would go ahead and uh, he would label that distributism because the means of production are distributed among society. Second, limit the power of the state. So the state does not have the power to throw people in jail for not working or to uh, limit the wage or to limit the person's ability to own property. These two processes, distributing the means of production and limiting the power of the state, create necessary conditions, but they do not confer what is essential, which is that the person who now has free time has to be capable of leisure. It's important to understand that the, the state that depends or the system that depends upon the worker being nothing but a worker is going to form its people in that image. The education system is going to be geared towards teaching them not to think, teaching them just to accept what is given to them, to ignore, in the, in the words of uh, George Orwell, to ignore the evidence of their eyes and just listen to what the state tells them. It's going to provide entertainments that keep them dumb, that keep their their minds um, for, forever revolving around um, thrill, around spectacle, panem et circum, um, to use the Latin phrase, bread and circuses. Or in the modern world, um, you know, social welfare, you, here, here's a handout and here's an iPhone, or you can just watch TV all day long. You can surf the internet looking for, looking for porn. You can play video games. Anything to keep your mind weak and flaccid so that you cannot engage with reality. So this brings us to a question of social teaching, which is wages. How much, what is, what is a just wage? What is a living wage? He makes the distinction that traditionally an intellectual does not receive a wage. An artist does not receive a wage. A philosopher does not receive a wage. The um, university play, uh, pays them an honorarium, an honorarium, which is basically an honorary stipend that it covers their living expenses so that they have the time to pursue this poetry, art, philosophy, whatever. It's not a wage because it recognizes that, quite strictly speaking, what they do has no monetary value. Um, it's priceless. Priceless, in modern terminology, you say, oh, that's a priceless diamond. It's so hard to produce that nowadays, it's priceless. Well, no, it's not priceless. It just has a very large price. This house has a very large price. Priceless is something that you, you strictly speaking, can't put a price on because its worth is on a different level than the cost of materials and manufacture. Um, when you're talking about somebody, somebody's philosophy, what are the cost of materials? What are its manufacture? Well, it's just time. It's just the, the time of the person. He needs enough of a living so that he doesn't have to work. Um, he doesn't have to you know, spend his time earning his daily bread so he can spend his time doing this other thing. The, the, the planned work system does away with this. Everybody is paid a wage. It monetizes the production of art. So this art, this art um, influences this many people and makes them vote in this way. We can, we can measure it and we can commodify it, we can monetize it and pay somebody based on how many clicks, and this is you know, modern, not in just Joseph Pippa's time, how many clicks does your work generate us? And we pay you based on that. 
how many um, likes and how many reviews and how many stars. And um, we find ways of measuring and monetizing and commodifying what is strictly speaking priceless. It has no, the totalitarian system extends this idea of the wage to the intellectual. So Stalin would say, and Stalin actually said in his speech in the Soviet system, people are paid not according to their need, but according to their production, how much they provide for the state. You provide more for the state, you get paid more of a wage. Compare that to Pope Pius XI in Quadragissimo Anno. In the first place, the worker has the right to a wage sufficient to support himself and his family. It's like, it doesn't matter what he produces for society. He, as a human being, and as the as the supporter of a family, has the right to a wage that can support that family. Two wildly divergent views of the meaning of a wage. And even, even among the uh, people who are drastically opposed to communism and socialism, you'll still find this attitude infecting us of, well, why should we pay that person a wage if they're not producing for contributing to society? Because the human being is more than his contribution to society. This does not mean that everybody gets a free pass to lay around doing nothing and getting paid by the state. That's not what that means. What it means is that even somebody who performs a function, no matter how menial, has the right to live and to live in a manner consistent with his human dignity and to provide for his family. Far from taking the honorar the honorarium away and giving the professor a wage, the, the medievals would say that in every work, no matter how menial, menial it is, there is an aspect of the human and therefore the, the essentially priceless. Um, that person who spent years carving a beautiful relief sculpture on the backside of a beam that was going to go and uh, I think it was Chartres Cathedral or Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, and people would ask, well, why are you doing that? Nobody's ever going to see it and say, God sees it. That he was doing, he was taking a menial task, putting a beam in a cathedral, preparing a beam to go into a cathedral. And he was injecting something human and something superhuman, something divine into it. How do you put a price on it? The, the man is putting in a beam but he still deserves the right to pay for his room and board, to pay for his food, to pay for his family, and to have a Sabbath, to have that one day in seven that is devoted to rest. Now, to finish out the chapter, Pipa is careful to point out that this does not, that just achieving the political means, the economic means to give people the time by distributing the means of production and limiting the power of the state, this does not automatically confer leisure. It's a necessary step, but it is not sufficient. What is necessary is we have to give people the, in the internal, the intellectual, the emotional, the spiritual capacity to uh, work their leisure, to use the, um, he translates that from the Greek, from, it was Aristotle, I had, yeah, it was Aristotle's politics to work their leisure. We now have the question to answer, with what should man occupy his leisure? And that will be the question that we take up in chapter five. That's all for today. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope it uh, kind of sparked your interest and got you thinking a little bit. Um, if it helps you to get thinking, go ahead and give it a like, um, share it among your friends. Um, Let's me know that uh, somebody's list that somebody's actually listening, and I'm not just kind of sitting here talking to a blank camera. Um, that's it. I'll see you guys next time.